here in America, we've had you know, a couple hundred years of feeling pretty well protected from the world thanks to these oceans that surround our, our country, you know, on the east and the west coast. And obviously with nuclear weapons, that's less the case, but we've reached a detente with other nuclear powers that we understand it would be mutually assured destruction and we don't launch those um, for the most part. This, this threat doesn't recognize oceans, boundaries. This makes everyone accessible. If, if as you've posited, the supercomputer, the superintelligence uh, can create drones that come right to your doorstep and drop a bomb or create an office robot that may be cleaning the carpets at night, but then assassinate the CEO when they turn around. Like there's all sorts of nefarious ways in which it could be unleashed on people worlds away. Um, yeah, I think with respect to super intelligence, like, yeah, I think, I think we're all kind of eggs in the same basket. Um, at least with respect to this class of dangers that arise from the AI itself doing something that is on the line with its creator's intention. Um, so yeah, I think we have a common cause there to, to try to figure out how to, how to align these systems. So, and I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful about that. When I was writing this book of mine, I think came out in 2014, this was an almost entirely neglected field. It looked like we were moving towards developing the most important technology ever and and hardly anybody was thinking about what would happen if we were succeeding in, in this goal of AI. It's all along been to not just do specific tasks, but to make machines generally smart like humans. But it was like that was such a radical goal that the imagination exhausted itself in just conceiving of this possibility of matching humans, that it couldn't take the obvious next step, that if we reach that, we will have super intelligence and then thinking about the consequences. So yeah, drawing attention to that was a big part of the reason for writing this book. But since then, um, there has now sprung up a kind of technical subfield of, of people doing serious research and actually trying to figure out how to align, you know, arbitrarily capable AI systems by harnessing their ability to learn, uh, uh, to make them better able to learn and understand what what our intentions are when we ask them to do something mm -hmm. or what to train them on specific tasks. That's crazy that that was only seven years ago that, that this wasn't even being discussed that seriously yeah. by, by those you know, academics and so on who, who are now taking such a hard look at it. Be meanwhile, this is probably going to be an industry that employs many of our children, grandchildren, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I mean it, certainly if there are advances in AI, it's going to have a big economic impact. I mean, it might be that if you get super intelligence, then the effects on employment will be, I mean, at, at some point, like if you have sufficiently generally capable AI, basically all jobs become automatable. Um, mm -hmm. So I think in a good scenario, I mean, in some sense, the goal is full on employment, right? So the idea is to try to develop technologies um, so powerful that, that they, we don't have to do stuff we don't like to do. Um, and so if, if you define work as the kind of thing, things people have to pay you to do, then um, yeah, almost all of that could theoretically be done by a sufficiently capable AI system. For some it tasks, sounds totally unfulfilling. It sounds awful. Well, I think it would be a situation where we would have to rethink a lot of our assumptions about what it means to be human, kind of from the ground up. Um, I actually believe that there would be some extremely wonderful possibilities in that would be unlocked by by this, but um, it it would require a pretty yeah ground up rethink. Um, we would, for example, have to find our dignity and, and meaning in life, not not in what we do for a living or like being a breadwinner, uh, but but in other areas, in, in, in relationships, in hobbies, in, in, in things we do for their own sake, rather than as a means to some, some other end. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that I think would be a kind of a high quality problem to have for us. I mm -hmm. think first we need to make sure uh, we don't uh, kind of crash into something on the way there. Mm -hmm. Well, and before we get to sort of the, the benefits, um, 
Let's talk about the possibility of a terrorist getting a hold of this technology if if we create it or it creates itself from something we've created, or even an actor like China, which is very advanced in the AI field. And our defense secretary has made clear that this is an area in which we're equal. We're not at best. We're equal uh, with China. It's not like our military is so much more powerful than theirs. It is. But I'm just saying in this department, which is a potential security threat, they're they're on par with us and they're working it and they aim to be the world leader in AI. So and and we don't trust China for good reason. So we do need to be worried about what they're going to create. Um, not to mention, as I say, somebody more nefarious, like a terrorist actor. So what are what is the likelihood of that? Well, I, I think at, at, at present, um, the West is ahead in AI, uh, certainly in this kind of basic research uh, of trying to develop general artificial intelligence. Um, but but it's not it's not a huge lead. It's not like as twenty years ahead or something like that. The the field is very open. Researchers publish their findings, and so other teams can catch up within like six months or a year. Or so, um, um, I'm, I'm not so worried really about terrorists using uh, AI for particular things. I, I would be more worried about terrorists using, say, biological weapons, uh, which um, at the moment would be uh, a lot more destructive and uh, are also becoming much easier to to use or obtain through advances in synthetic biology. Um, um, but it is possible that AI will become one dimension of um, a great power competition um, as, as it becomes an increasingly important both economic uh, factor and, and also factor in, in national security. Because I know you've said um, that the, the first super intelligence to be creative will have a decisive first mover advantage, that there will be a lot of power and being the first one to come up with it. And so, I mean, how worried should we be that somebody not all that friendly to the United States will be the person who who has it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's possible that it would have this indecisive first mover advantage. I, I'm, I'm not at all sure about that. You could also imagine scenarios in which the transition happens a bit more gradually. Uh, if, if, if it's not like an overnight or over week thing where you get from human to radical super intelligence, but suppose it takes several years, then you could easily have multiple uh, labs or countries being more or less going through this um, transition in tandem. And, and you might then have a multipolar outcome. Um, but yeah, I do think it's potential for uh, exacerbating conflicts of different kind uh, or empowering, say, uh, despots to you know, make themselves more immune from overthrow by intelligence applications, surveillance applications, and so forth. That, that is certainly uh, one concern.